Well, well, she she were maha tranona. I was boilam buihis a hord the the eve. I was the Leon. I was the Eric as Kuru Kararam Avian Shaw or Majin. I was the Makamra the Ura and Shaw an Irish forum. Great to be here in in uh, the wonderful uh, capital of radical education, which is UC Berkeley. Uh, its reputation, of course, precedes uh, precedes university as the the birthplace of the free speech movement and a great privilege to be uh, talking here today. Uh, but also to be in the great city of Berkeley and in that regard I want to really thank Mayor Tom Bates who is a dear friend of Belfast and Derry and, and, and of Ireland. Um, and of course Senator Lonnie Hancock uh, from, the, from the state le legislature who is another great friend of, of the peace process and of justice uh, and of really all progressive causes not only in California but in Ireland as well so thank you um, and, and here's, here's the good news I have set the alarm for 4pm so I'm going to talk for 17 minutes and then I'm happy to have a conversation for another 17 if it was over 34, you know, it's, it's, I think it would be too long. So I want uh, to do, three, I want to do three, three things and you'll understand why they're all connected to, to Brexit. The first is to tell you a little bit about, about myself and about the Irish peace process. Um, and uh, I came into politics in 1981. So some, I know when you're young you think it doesn't matter if it's before 2000, it's a million years ago. Uh, but 1981 was a long time ago and it was the time of the hunger strike in, in the north of Ireland, a time of great division and polarisation and uh, uh, really a time when people took, took strong positions and sides and um, uh, I came into politics at that time in support of the prisoners, uh, the hunger striking prisoners. And then in 1985 I stood to be a council member in Belfast and Belfast was very much a uh, a one-party uh, city. Uh, it wasn't a city in which my, especially my parents were brought up in, but it wouldn't have been a, it would have been a cold house for uh, people from my tradition in the city of Belfast. And that's people who were Irish, uh, who believed in a united Ireland, and who came from the Catholic community. Uh, but I came into the council in 1987 with Sinn Féin, and of course Jerry Adams was then, and still is, the, the leader of Sinn Féin. Um, and on my first meeting, I uh, spoke in Irish. Uh, for some reason, it was a debate about the Ulster Orchestra, <laughs> but uh, I, it didn't strike a chord when I got up to speak because I, I said a few words in Irish. I said, Boilem Lord Tanisha, Kjoller and Olu. And the Unionists, and the Unionists are those who are British and support the link uh, with, with London, um, they had this wonderful tradition. They would vote that you be not heard. So a vote was taken. And that, in that time, Unionists would have the entire, this side, the other side of the room, which would be 50%, plus about a third on this side. So it was maybe, you know, 60, 65, 65% of the city. And so I was being not heard, so I continued to speak. And then the second vote is that you be put out by the police. So my first meeting was 10 minutes. Uh, <laughs> and one of my friends once said, how did they stand you for a whole 10 minutes? <laughs> and uh, after that, I mean, Belfast was a, a disaster zone in that time. Uh, at every monthly meeting, you would have a, a list of people who had been killed in the previous month. British soldiers, civilians from the Protestant community, civilians from the Catholic community, uh, RUC officers, the police force at the time, IRA volunteers, uh, mainly civilians more than anyone else. So it was a very, uh, a very divided society, uh, very hurt society and wounded. And one of the great problems of conflict is, as, as even in recent times you found out in other countries where America is, is embroiled in wars, is that every death creates more reasons for people to continue to fight. Um, it's very hard to break the cycle because if you, we would come into a meeting on a, on a Monday morning saying at the weekend there maybe had been an attack on a, on a colleague's uh, home. Uh, the leader of our group on the council, Alex Maskey, was shot in the stomach in 1987. His house attacked many times. Uh, my council colleague, Bobby Lavery, who then lived in San Francisco for a long time, his son, Sean, was shot dead in 1993 uh, in response and retaliation for the fact that we managed to get the first ever march, the Nationalist March 
uh, Pu Sinn Féin March in the Belfast City Centre that night. A gang went out working with the police and shot dead his son. So there was always reasons when you come in to say, you know, this, you know, we just this has this has to go on. There has to be. Uh, I don't think it's just revenge, but there was always a reason for someone dead. Then you need to follow on. So the great magic was breaking that uh, breaking that cycle of violence, and. During those years in Belfast City Council, we started a process of going to the courts. And although the courts would have been uh, very establishment, uh, they responded again and again to support us. So in the early years of the council, 1987-88, I was banned from all committees, all committees. So I couldn't sit on the leisure committee, I couldn't sit on the parks committee. Um, and then we went to court and the court said, these guys have a democratic mandate. They, you have to learn to sit on committees. So they said, okay. So you can sit on the committee, but we're setting up a subcommittee with everyone except you. <laughs> uh, and then when they had civic functions, say they invited the, the mayor of London over, we wouldn't get invited to the civic functions. Uh, at uh, one time, they, they tried to uh, bar us from the car parks. They, basically, they tried to treat us as, they tried to put us to the back of the bus. And we took a series of court cases around the issue of discrimination. And, you know, we just had this, this, this great streak of victories. We just won one, two, three, four, uh, which really made the council treat everyone the same. And my solicitor at that time, my attorney at that time, was a man called Pat Finucane, a uh, wonderful civil rights attorney who used to say to us, um, your uh, obligation, your duty is to discharge your responsibilities as an elected representative. You have a duty to go into the forum, which is City Hall, to stand up and to represent your constituents. And we took that very serious, and I take that, that obligation very serious today as a public servant. And Pat Finucane was shot dead in his home in February 1989, probably the most famous case of what we call collusion, which is work between the government and uh, paramilitaries to, to, to carry out killings uh, and still is a case of huge controversy. But we did manage to change Belfast City Hall but also demographics helped. The, the city became a, a, a brighter place as well. But the big change was the IRA ceasefire of 1994 which was for me was unbelievable because I thought there would never be an end to the armed campaign. Uh, and yet Jerry Adams, Martin McGuinness, of course, is now the leader of Sinn Féin in, 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 the, in the Assembly in Stormont in Belfast. Uh, they managed to find a way with a, uh, with a British government, which is open to, for, for peace, but in particular with President Clinton. This, this, this hugely influential in, intervention from 3,000 miles away uh, by President Clinton, who ignored the advice of the State Department, took a risk for peace, and... Uh, created what has been since then, after South Africa, the most successful peace process in the world. And recently, the, uh, as you know, in Colombia, they had a vote for the peace process in Colombia, peace treaty, which lost by a half percent. But the president of Colombia uh, asked, uh, he asked Sinn Féin, my party, to send negotiators to Cuba to help with the process, help with the peace process, and Martin McGuinness did that, sent people. And one of the reasons the President of Colombia went for the peace and the negotiation of treaties was what he saw in Belfast. He saw the changes and the transformation in the city. And that transformation has been profound. Uh, and since the ceasefire of 1994, and the gains made since then, an understanding that the only way to affect change was or through peaceful and wholly democratic means. Um, the understanding that everyone would be treated the same in the state of, of, the state of Northern Ireland. Um, the peace agreement forged by Senator Mitchell, who still remains very, very active, uh, was again a beautiful piece of architecture uh, formed by a, an American, uh, American politician of, of great repute. And that peace agreement has stood the test of time. So you go back to Belfast today, it's a very vibrant city, uh, it is a dynamic city, it is home to uh, North American companies like Tyco, Liberty, Allstate, New York Stock Exchange was there, Chicago Mercantile Exchange, uh, really a, a lot of uh, knowledge economy businesses, including White Hot Security from the West Coast, Mod Squad of Sacramento. So a very vibrant, progressive city where now the council is evenly balanced. The council is, 
a very progressive force on on the during you know, the pride parades parade takes place each year, the biggest parade in the city of Belfast, and we have a lot of parades, the biggest parade in the city of Belfast is the Pride Parade through the city centre. So we light up City Hall in the colours of the rainbow. On St Patrick's Day we light it up green. On the Orange Men's Day, 12th of July, we, we, we light it up orange. And there has been a real attempt by the City Hall to change things. So, so that's the first thing I wanted to say about that journey of change. Uh, the people who built the peace, the people who took risks for peace, and especially our, our gratitude to Irish America for being a guarantor of the peace. So that's one thing to understand. The second thing is then the economics. And, you know, peace processes are about economics. They're about a fair shake. They're about the opportunity to win and, and keep employment. And that was a, a, a great problem uh, when m my parents' generation, where it would be very, very difficult for people from the Catholic tradition uh, to enjoy employment, for example, in the shipyards, where there are 30,000 people, uh, in, the, in, the, in the industrial foundries, and, and really the whole manufacturing uh, industry in which Belfast was based. Uh, there, would have been a, there would have been Catholic community excluded from that. But today you have a much more, uh, uh, you've clearly a very fair uh, economic system, but our economy is still weak. Our economy is weaker than the economy in the south of Ireland. So the average wage in, in North of Ireland is twenty five thousand five hundred euro. The average wage in the South of Ireland is thirty seven thousand euro. The the economic growth in the North of Ireland this year will be one percent, one percent. Estimated next year to be point two percent, point two percent. Economic growth south of the border, south of Ireland, this year will be over four percent. Next year downgraded it a little bit because of the threat of Brexit, but still above four percent. Uh, if you look at average GDP across the European Union, 28 states, uh, the GDP of, of the Republic of Ireland, the South of Ireland, would be around 134% of the average. Now, there are questions about how they measure GDP uh, recently, but still you see a very resurgent economy, even though the recovery is not even, a resurgent economy. The GDP in the North of Ireland would be 82% of the European average, around about Slovenia. And we have a, a rate of economic inactivity, which is higher than Scotland or Wales, and much higher in the south. And our unemployment rate is low, it's around 6%, uh, but that would be higher than Scotland or England. So, so we have these real economic challenges, and part of it is traditionally the relationship with London, where uh, they control taxation, which is very important to me as a finance minister. Uh, and he who controls taxation really dictates economic policy. And we have a dependent economy. It depends on subsidy from Britain. And while some of my, my colleagues in the government uh, from, the, from the unionist tradition think that's a great thing. In fact, I think it encourages a, a, uh, an economy which can't drive forward, which is not dynamic. And we need to get that balance right. We need to incentivize and encourage growth. So first of all, you have the peace process. Second, you have an economy which really is in need of being driven forward. Less part-time jobs. Uh, more people really going up the value chain in terms of the knowledge economy, trying to create a much more vibrant uh, economic base and workforce. So you have the peace process and you have the economy, and they're all linked to Brexit, because Brexit is the greatest threat to the uh, efforts to build a new future and a bright future and a shared future and a prosperous future for all our people. There is no economic upside of Brexit, uh, not for us uh, in the north of Ireland. There is no uh, prospect of additional trade. So they talk about we're going to be able to have a new trade agreement with Australia. Well, but 1% of British trade, 1.4% is with Australia, and 44% is with the European Union. Uh, they talk we'll make a wonderful new deal, another deal with Canada. Uh, they talk really about splendid isolation of the sort of the English attitude, I think, of the 19th century and 20th century, that somehow you return to this glorious day of days of empire. And the irony for us is that uh, all the economic studies before the vote said that, the, uh, that there would be a recession and that it would be longer and more severe in the north of Ireland than it would be in Britain. And, and I do believe that, that that will still come to pass, that while the British economy has weathered the first few months after the EU referendum, 
I believe the worst consequences of Brexit are still to come. So we're going to get an economic economic blowback from Brexit because, of course, we share a border with the uh, European Union state. Um, uh, of course, the, the Scotland, Wales, and England don't. And the the prospect of a hard border, which would come from a hard Brexit, is is absolutely uh, terrifying for those who live in the border region, who have never enjoyed the uh, prosperity or the economic uplift of other areas, and they see a return to what would have been in my childhood border border posts, passport checking, uh, hard border, uh, either military on the border or police on the border or customs officials on the border. So the the uh, no matter what way you cut it, there are no economic advantages of, of a Brexit. But go back then to the peace process. And Senator Mitchell, interviewed yesterday on British radio, said that uh, he thought it would be bad for the equilibrium of the peace process. And all peace processes and negotiations are a matter of balance. You know, nobody gets everything they want, but you leave the table feeling it's a good deal. And one of the reasons we managed to create this transformative peace agreement in 1998, which was certainly the peace has been the greatest gift ever given to my generation and you know transformed the lives of our, our children and our grandchildren. One of the reasons the peace agreement worked was because both states were in the European Union, that the, uh, the UK government uh, and the Irish government and those of us who lived in the, in the north of Ireland, we knew that, okay, two states still exist. The, the, the peace deal really uh, centred around the British saying of a majority in the north of Ireland, vote to leave, uh, vote to leave United Kingdom, they can do so. But until that happens, everyone has to be treated with equality. And we knew that that was a tough deal for us because we support United Ireland. But we had this, this little guarantee, well, we're both in the EU. Uh, I have an Irish passport. There won't be any checks crossing the border. Um, it was the European Union then and came in behind the peace process, not only with with, with billions of, of dollars of, of aid for different programs. But they also come in behind it by saying, we, we endorse, we're a guarantor, we want this to succeed. And that, that really was a, a great uh, 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 leverage and bulwark for, for the peace to grow and prosper. If you remove that, uh, as Senator Mitchell said yesterday, and you go back to the, the idea of, of a hard border, or, or two, two, the two states being in different uh, uh, and different arrangements, not in the same trading bloc, uh, not in the same. And the European Union is much more than economics, much more than economics. It is a belief that we are better uh, celebrating our difference, working together, than going back to the terrible wars which ravaged uh, Europe twice in the 20th century. And so Brexit hurts the peace which I talked about and how difficult it was to get there and how many people died, you know, over 3,000 people died in that 25, 26 year period from 69, 70 to, to maybe 94, 95, 96. And it's a threat, threat to the, the economics as well. How then will we prevent this Brexit? Because the key point is that, it's not four o'clock up there yet, so I've, I've still have, I surely have two minutes. So, so how do you prevent uh, a Brexit if it's so damaged? And Mar Martin McGuinness said yesterday it'll be a disaster. Well, the first thing is you vote against it. And of course, that's what happened in the north of Ireland. 56% of the people, nationalists, unionists, people of no, no political connection, uh, Catholic, Protestant, people of no religion, voted to stay. They wanted to stay in Europe because we really believe that our history and heritage has been as Europeans. Um, we, and we believe our future is as Europeans. We do not want to be dragged out of Europe. So we had a chance to, to have our say. And, and I believe the consent, the, no, the consent of the North of Ireland, which is needed for United Ireland, you can't have United Ireland until a majority vote in favour of it. But I think that's absolute principle, a principle core of how we do our business. And 56% voted to stay. So that's the first thing. Irish America needs to say that they uh, will advocate for those who voted to stay to have the right to stay. They will advocate for the, the democratic mandate to be respected. And Irish America has the most potent voice in all of this. So the European Union is vitally important. And thank, thankfully, the Irish government is on that side of the negotiating table as well, because they're with the 27 other states in negotiations. 
But Ari Shimarega is the absolute key. And we need, like never before, Ari Shimarega to say, not that it's a special situation, that's not enough. We need to say this is a special case, that we created, as George Mitchell said, created this peace process based on the principle of consent within the north of Ireland. That in this vital issue, which goes to the very heart of peacemaking and of creating a, a vibrant and dynamic economy and creating a shared uh, future, prosperous, reconciled people, that there needs to be an end to the efforts to drive us out of Europe. That special case will have to mean that we, that we in the North uh, can't, can't tolerate for a minute, for a day, a hard border. Either soldiers on the border, police on the border, customs officials on the border with, with guns. Uh, we can't have people who live on one side of the border and work on the other be, 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 be stopped in any way. So a hard Brexit, which is the preference of the British Prime Minister, a hard Brexit is absolutely inimical to the peace process, inimical to our interests. And Irish America needs to be uh, a focal voice in that. So the, the way to do it is to argue for a special case. You argue for a special case in the peace process because the British government said, no, we're not going to negotiate with Jerry Adams. And, that, and in that time, they said there has to be a majority government. And that's it. They, wouldn't, they didn't, encount, didn't countenance the very complex architecture of the peace deal. But it was Irish America that brought the British to the negotiating table. So the time ahead, we do believe and have confidence in our own ability to speak up and speak out. And as finance minister, uh, I'm doing that. We also believe that the Irish government and the Taoiseach and the Kenny, who is bringing together, I think this week, a, 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 an all-island forum to have a dialogue about this, that he will advocate for our right to be a special case and to remain. But the missing part of the jigsaw is we need Irish America to also say that this cannot be tolerated. That if there's to be a special case for the city of London, who want a special case around finance, a special case for the north of England around its manufacturing industry, that a million times more important is we have a special case which will make sure that the work that we're all involved in, the work which Irish America helped create, uh, that that is not sabotaged or jeopardized in the time ahead. So, Shinola you know, Rago. That's what I have to say. We didn't do too bad. It's 19 minutes past four. So let's have a conversation about that if, if before the Halloween parties start. So, Eve, would that be okay?